get started. Um, just so everyone knows, we are recording this webinar and it's going to be available on our website a little bit later. Um, and the first thing that I'd like to do is acknowledge that I'm hosting this webinar from the unceded Mi'kmaq territory of Chibuktuk. Uh, long before settlers arrived in North America, Mi'kmaq, the Mi'kmaq lived on and stewarded this land for tens of thousands of years. Despite hundreds of years of oppressive governance from settler nations, the resilience of the Mi'kmaq worldview and long practice stewardship of Turtle Island has continued. And like many indigenous peoples around the world, Mi'kmaq are leaders in calling for climate justice. And so it's important to ensure that we do not acknowledge the land with words alone and that we work always to amplify indigenous voices, support initiatives to promote truth and reconciliation and work to dismantle systemic uh, racism and center equity in our homes, workplaces, and when we gather with our peers. And so with that being said, uh, welcome to the Better Building Speaker Series. My name is Claire Morley. I'm an energy efficiency officer with the Ecology Action Center, a nonprofit in Jibokduk that um, takes leadership on environmental issues in and around Nova Scotia or Mi'kma'ki. And um, we are delivering this uh, webinar in partnership with Efficiency Nova Scotia, which is Canada's first energy efficiency utility. And they help to deliver thousands of energy efficiency projects all around our province. Today, um, we are talking about the Mi'kmaq Center for Healing and Resilience that is in construction. <laughs> Um, at the moment, and we are joined by the team that is helping um, to, to design and build the, the structure. Um, we're joined by Jordan Willett from Solter Designs, uh, Sue Sears from Outside Landscape Architects, and Sabrina Whitman from Young Soaring Eagle. And they are going to provide a presentation on the center that will be run by the Nova Scotia uh, Native Women's Association. And uh, we're so pleased to have you all and I'll stop talking and let you all start your presentation um, that we're all looking forward to very much. Awesome, thank you, Claire. I'm first on the block, but, uh, and I'll introduce myself a little bit more shortly, but I'm very fortunate that uh, Jordan is running the deck for all of us. So I feel super spoiled that way. Uh, I know that there's a few people I was looking at the attendee list um, that have heard me speak about this. And I had to jam pack um, the components that Jordan will speak to as well, that Sue will speak to um, all in a 30 minute presentation. So I'm so happy that I actually have the experts that can speak to the whole thing. Um, I will apologize to folks because my slides are very uh, dull and lackluster in imagery because I'm saving it for when you hear the other two speakers and they can speak to all of these beautiful layers um, of the center. So as said, my name is Sabrina Whitman. I am Mi'kmaq from Gloose Cap First Nation myself and uh, my company Young Soaring Eagle Consulting. We work on behalf of uh, largely Indigenous organizations, but also we work with private sector and government as well. And our business is founded very much on Mi'kmaq values of respect and reciprocity. So in any project we do, whether it's project management, such as this project, or it's developing policy or anything, or developing relationships, it's really ensuring that uh, respect, reciprocity, and communication is at the forefront of how we go about the projects. So uh, you'll hear a little bit later when Sue talks about some challenges or things that we've had to do. Just because I am Mi'kmaq does not mean I'm an expert in anything. What I am good at is being able to identify who the experts are that you need to talk to, um, to inform the work. So very much this center I'm excited about because it is the first of its kind in Canada. You see, you will see in here how the different layers of the building are fully a reflection of our culture and identity. And so often you don't see that, that typically um, we're for, forced to conform to spaces and make our culture and our needs reflect those spaces that we're working in where it's the reverse in this space. So it's truly exciting. So if I just kind of go to our first slide and give you a bit of background information, 
Uh, first, I should talk a little bit about the Nova Scotia Native Women's Association. I don't do it as well as the executive director, Karen Picto, but uh, the Nova Scotia Native Women's Association is actually the oldest organization, Indigenous organization in the province of Nova Scotia. It was founded actually in 1972. And what makes it unique as well is that it is the only Indigenous organization in the province that doesn't have sitting on its board of directors, at least one or a few chiefs, if not all of the chiefs, which is interesting in a number of ways. I'll, I'll speak to a little bit later on about the challenges that creates in terms of funding but it really demonstrates how the organization works on behalf of any indigenous uh, woman, two-spirited individual or girl in this province, whether they're Mi'kmaq or whether they're from another First Nation or they're Métis, uh, they work on behalf of all of them. And the role of Nova Scotia Native Women is as an advocacy group, as well as providing programs and support to, as I said, uh, indigenous women, girls and two-spirited individuals, as well as their families. They work in a number of areas of, first of all, and I have to look at the list because they're doing so much now, um, areas that they work in is enforced or coerced sterilization. Obviously um, working in MMIWG, so Missing Murdered yeah. Indigenous Women and Girls and ensuring the implementation of the action plan that was released. They work heavily in overall in the elimination of violence, whether it's domestic violence or otherwise. They work in the areas of human trafficking as well as working with individuals who are sex traffickers. We also have, I say we, because I work so closely with NSNWA and I'm a Mi'kmaq woman, so obviously I'm represented by the organization, um, but they also have a position called the Family Information Liaison Unit, FILU, and that individual works with families and survivors of residential schools in terms of um, providing the supports that they need in addressing intergenerational trauma. Um, as well as helping them navigate the court system as well, which can be really overwhelming trying to find family members that maybe are missing. They also have a position uh, for tripartite. So in Nova Scotia, the provincial government, the federal government and the Mi'kmaq all sit together at a tripartite table and they have a number of issues that they address in subcommittees. So for instance, women's issues, justice, um, these are all uh, different subcommittees that exist. So there is a position at NSNWA to ensure there's that trilateral conversations that are happening. And their role has expanded a lot in the last six years. So they're very heavily um, active in housing and homelessness in particular, uh, working in Cape Breton where there's a really huge need, but across the province, especially. Uh, they also are working with the food bank. They have a food bank coordinator at their location in Cape Breton at their Jane Paul Center. Um, but also this center will be having a location for the food bank because food security is such a concern. They also have a child and youth worker. They're also developing um, a midwifery program, which is super exciting. And they have education and employment opportunities offered at the center. So they do a lot. And as I said, in particular, over the last few years, their capacity has grown quite a bit. And the staff are governed by a board of directors. They have 16 board of directors. Uh, 13 of them come from the 13 Mi'kmaq communities across the province. And then three represent off reserve. So one for the Halifax region, one for Cape Breton region and one for the South Shore region as well. And so for those who are not familiar, I will have to say, Claire, that is one of the most beautiful land acknowledgements I've ever heard and very well done. Um, but for those who aren't aware, uh, Nova Scotia, the Mi'kmaq are the only First Nation that are originally from this land. We are the only nation that exists here. And there are 13 communities across the province that exist that are governed by chief and councils. So that's why, like I said, you have uh, 13 seats uh, for women who are elected, but in no way are elected council, as I said earlier, from those chiefs and councils. So that's basically the organization. They do incredible work. The women are working tirelessly all the time, working on issues of, of huge, huge concern um, and night and day. And I'll get into that a little bit more about some challenges we've had along the way. So in terms of the background and for how the Resiliency Center came about, 
The concept of a resiliency center, that term resiliency center was created by the Native Women's Association of Canada. So that's a national uh, advocacy group that exists. And um, all the provincial and territorial or territorial organizations across the country like Nova Scotia Native Women, or as I say, NSNWA, sit at that national body. So in 2018, they had an annual general assembly where a resolution was passed that they wanna have resiliency centers across the country. And the president of the Nova Scotia Native Women's Association at that time was really excited by that concept and she wanted to have the first and the best because Mi'kmaq aren't competitive at all, um, resiliency center in the country outside of the national capital region. Still the best, but the first one outside of the national capital region. So we started the work in 2019. I came onto the project in a voluntary capacity because I am a policy analyst by trade and they needed support in trying to figure out how to get funds um, and bring on government to support this project. So I, during my uh, summer vacation, took this on as a side project and then just continued to do it. Um, if I can even say my spare time, but started to work on it for the organization. Uh, shortly after the president took on this project, she actually got elected nationally as the national president of the Native Women's Association of Canada. So all of our work on this project has actually been independent of NWAC. We've done it all on our own. And we did that because we didn't want to create a perceived conflict of interest or a real conflict of interest for the national president. So we just uh, didn't engage them whatsoever, which is, um, I think, a big testament to the work of the entire team that's worked on this project. Um, in particular, though, because the concept of resiliency center is really the national concept and language is such an important role in terms of revitalization and healing, we will be changing the name of the center at some point to a Mi'kmaq name that better reflects um, what we're trying to describe this place to be. But resiliency, you will see all throughout it, throughout it resiliency really is um, a key term for discussion. It's about how can we revitalize our culture and identity and how can we heal? And for the Mi'kmaq, we are a matriarchal society. And so what that means is healing as well as just the functioning of our society and our governance structure goes all the way back to the mother. The mother and women are the core of our society. So. Um, if we can't support our women, if we don't ensure healing of the family unit, that means that we are really disadvantaged in terms of moving forward um, and addressing reconciliation and in terms of supporting our self-determination. So that's at the core of what the center is all about. But the actual direct need for Nova Scotia Native women, as you'll see from this slide, comes from two particular things. One is that at minimum, um, we needed a space for the women who were working for the organization that made, um, met basic uh, occupational health and safety needs. I know Jordan has personally seen where the women were working originally. Uh, it isn't or wasn't a trailer, but it wasn't far um, different from a trailer. It really was a small space that women were trying to work in on top of one another. And there was no way that you could provide supports to clients because you couldn't ensure confidentiality within those spaces. In addition to the need that the staff had just for a space to work from that was safe, is that we needed a safe place to actually be offering programs and services to women, girls, two-spirited individuals and their families that was culturally safe. So as of right now, until our center is built, we've been having to rent out spaces. Typically they're in hotels. And they haven't all been positive experiences across the group, the, the board, though, they certainly haven't been Mi'kmaq spaces. So that means that they just don't feel safe. You can't do smudging in those spaces. People might question some of the ceremonies you do. Um, and in some of the worst cases, we have experienced right out racism. Um, I think some of the worst situations have been we have individuals walking the red road, which means um, they're abstaining from drugs and alcohol. They may have addiction issues themselves. So it's really important that they're not put in compromised situations. And they've gone into restaurants in some of the hotels and they've been denied service, except if they sit at the bar because of how they look. 
and forcing someone who has addiction issues to sit at a bar where they're serving alcohol um, is not supporting their health and well-being. So that's why spaces are important that we have, um, that we create ourselves so that we know that everyone feels safe. And Nova Scotia Native Women also provides even programs. And the one example was actually um, happened to men and boys because we do try, we recognize that healing relates to the entire family unit. So those were the two primary needs in terms of why we needed a center. It's really unique in terms of how we did engagement and it goes to the importance of our culture is the Mi'kmaq are a very supportive nation. While we are competitive, um, we want to ensure that we don't overlap with programs and services that each other is providing. So in 2019 and 2020, we did a very strong and heavy feasibility study that looked at different layers um, that the organization could be offering for programs and services. So cultural, uh, as well as looking at environmental, economic development, and the agricultural side as well. But it also was heavy outreach to all of our Mi'kmaq organizations and engagement with our chiefs, the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq chiefs as well. Why we engage the other Mi'kmaq organizations is, as I said, we wanted to ensure that we collaborated, that the space we were creating had spaces for them to administer programs and services as well, and that we weren't creating a space that was duplicating services because uh, we do have a huge infrastructure need in Nova Scotia for Mi'kmaq organizations. And so there was a huge demand for a few of us uh, needing infrastructure dollars. Two of the more important ones that folks might be uh, aware of is the Mi'kmaq Friendship Center in Halifax, as well as Mi'kmaq Way to Burt, which is um, a place for housing our archeological um, evidence and materials as well as being a museum. So that is huge and, and very important. So we didn't wanna take away from those needs as well. And we had huge support from all of our organizations and from our leadership. And uh, it ensured that we can create a space that they, as I said, they can use as well, uh, whether it's Mi'kmaq Legal Support Network, whether it's our chiefs needing a space, or whether it's Mi'kmaq Family Children's Services and the Healing Center. And our location was selected. So where we're located is in Millbrook First Nation. For those who don't know where that is, it's in Truro. If you're driving along the highway where you see this giant uh, Indigenous man, which is Glues Cap, that's Millbrook, and that's called the Power Center. So our center is actually there. It's very unique to all of the buildings you'll see in that space, which is basically an industrial park, um, but we're on the far end. And the reason why we chose Millbrook was Millbrook really is our central location in the province um, for distance for individuals traveling from whether it's Unamagi, which is Cape Breton, or from fo folks traveling all the way from Yarmouth. Uh, so that central location, but the other factors that were important as well is for human trafficking. Basically, uh, the power center is one area that a lot of human trafficking happens with uh, truck drivers. And so once they leave the power center and go, leave, Nova, leave the power center, uh, it's basically the last spot before they leave Nova Scotia and are lost to us. So we wanted our center in a space that if someone needs to flee, um, that situation that we're close enough that they can get to us for that as well is that you have the Millbrook Healing Center just across the way it's in Millbrook but not directly in the power center and we will be a space where there will be programs and services for women living at the center so the the Millbrook Healing Center is a women's shelter so women and their children are living there and so we know that programs and services they need they can come over to the Resiliency Center but also um, largely those women may be fleeing domestic violence, but it, they need programs and services for healing the family unit. So their abuser may be coming to the center for programs as well uh, for healing the family unit. And it isn't safe for those women to have their abusers come to the healing center, but it would be safer that it's away at the resiliency center. So it provides that buffer um, but also ensures that there can be programs and services that take place. So basically, uh, that's a quick overview, but a very long overview in terms of the background and engagement that led us uh, to where we are. And if we go to the next slide, I'll speak quickly about funding. 
Uh, so this project has been phenomenal. When I said we did the, the engagement in the feasibility study as well, Saltaire did their functional programming. We had a meeting with all of our interested stakeholders, federal and provincial funders, the first week of March in 2020. And we were really hopeful coming out of that meeting that folks will come back with dollars to fund schematic design and design development. Again, I said it was the first week of March 2020 when we had that meeting. And so we were thinking end of fiscal year, dollars available, really exciting. Two weeks later, the whole world shuts down. And so there's definitely no dollars available for us whatsoever. Um, but it created a, a higher need for our organization as well, because uh, as everyone is aware, during COVID, mental health uh, issues increased, homelessness increased, addictions increased, and what goes hand in hand with addictions is domestic violence. And in Indigenous communities, it was exceptionally high. So the Nova Scotia Native women were actually working around the clock, trying to rescue women and their families in very um, dangerous situations. And they had no place to bring the women or to provide programs and services to the point even that they were trying to sneak women and their families into Nova Scotia when our borders were closed. Um, so it created an even greater urgency, but yet we couldn't find any dollars. And we were really challenged that way because as I mentioned earlier, our board of directors isn't composed of chiefs. That puts us at a significant disadvantage when applying for funding. Uh, funding, is elig funding eligibility largely goes to um, First Nation bands or if your board of directors has chiefs on it, the terminology on there um, speaks around to that. We don't have that. So that was a huge gap for us. There's also, it, proven evidence that women's organizations are not as funded as other organizations and especially indigenous female organizations as to the point um, that I identified. But we were really fortunate, the province of Nova Scotia, I have to identify, funded a lot of the work. So the dollars you see in front of us is just for construction. Our schematic design and design development was funded by the province of Nova Scotia, uh, especially, and I really, uh, identify this project, this program as being phenomenal. The Low Carbon Communities Program funded our design development phase. And then um, Indigenous Services did fund a large portion of our construction document phase. But the province uh, has been so helpful and useful to us. You'll hear shortly, uh, Jordan and Sue will speak a lot to it, but I'll give a brief explanation of around Nadumalik which is our understanding of sustainability, but I'm not going there yet, uh, is our understanding of sustainability. And so there was this program that came out called Green and Inclusive Communities Fund. And we were so excited because it exactly fitted what we were, or fit it, fit what we were trying to do. Uh, so we put in an application right away. We're hopeful that we would be successful. Uh, anyone, and I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with this fund, and because a lot there's a huge volume of applications went in, and because of that huge volume, they took over a year to make a decision, or almost a year to make a decision. We were one of those ones who were successful. And I got a call in June of last year that we were fully funded for what we asked for, and we had a very healthy contingency budget, but the joys of inflation due to COVID, our budget actually increased by 1.464 million dollars. So. As excited as I was when we received the call, I actually went into panic mode trying to figure out how I could come up with, not actually come up with the money, how we could cut our budget by 1.464 million. Um, and to the credit of the province of Nova Scotia, they actually, uh, all of the departments pulled money. Status of Women was the one who was really leading it. Uh, the Department of the Status of Women and the province provided us the, that gap funding that we needed. Um, so it was a huge, huge weight off my chest. And then we had this really exciting thing happen, the Healthy Communities Initiative. The year before, Sue and I worked on a proposal to them because this funding was only geared towards outdoor activities. And anyone who's familiar with design work, normally the landscaping has the smallest budget and it's the first budget cut. So we were excited because so much for us is land-based healing and you'll see all of the external uh, design elements. And when we first submitted the application, uh, we weren't successful. And I think because they saw we actually had funding to build the space, they reached out to us to resubmit and we received 
almost a quarter of a million dollars and it's all for our external spaces. So we could do even more with it, which is super exciting. And so the entire building, um, we've received funding for 8.27 million to construct this beautiful space that started in November. And as of last week, we had another application that was successful from Heritage Canada for almost a quarter of a million dollars. And that's basically just to furnish um, our maker space, which I'll speak to in a minute. Uh, and also to have track lighting throughout or track system throughout the space to showcase art. Um, so it's all on the cultural side. Um, and we now have a request into agriculture and agri-foods around food security, um, which is about $111,000. And that's to furnish our food security programming. Um, so we really hope that we get those dollars because the food security aspect um, is so critical to the programming that we'll be offering and where we're sitting at right now. So if anyone is able to network, I have no shame in saying this is that we have money to build the building. We have no money to furnish the building. Um, so that's where that Heritage Canada application and Agri Foods application went to. And for all of the programs you're gonna hear about, I need furniture for people to sit on um, or else I'll have some very disgruntled women um, banging at my door. So if we go to the next slide, I will speak to all of the amazing things that this center will be doing. You're going to see it um, firsthand when Jordan and Sue present those images, but I'll just give a quick overview of the building itself. One of the key components, uh, you heard me e earlier talk about spaces and how they're not indigenous spaces. We have to use them to do programming. One of the big things we were told by our board of directors, also by women that we engaged um, across the province is that they did not want this space to look like a residential school. When you come and see this building, it does not look like a residential school. It creates hope and joy. And even at our groundbreaking ceremony, the idea of this space um, happening created lots of happy tears because uh, it's, it's going to be exceptionally beautiful and it's exciting what it will be offering. So as I mentioned, safety is a huge, huge factor. If women are fleeing, as I said, human trafficking, the hope is that we will have a phone on the exterior of the building. So day or night, you can call um, directly to the RCMP for support. Um, also lighting is a key thing. So Sue will talk about our walking trail and having lighting on that, but the building itself because we don't want individuals coming up and fe fearing that there's predators around the corner and they don't know who it is that they're going to um, be coming, uh, interacting with. And so even in the design of the building, when you come in, access control and safety is the number one component um, in the design. Also, uh, in terms of design, we know hand in hand with um, being energy efficient is natural lighting, but natural lighting also has a significant role in mental health and wellness. So not only in terms of programming and design, are we wanting to ensure that the mental health and wellness of the clients and the individuals using the space is taken into consideration, but also the staff because they work on really heavy things. So those design elements have been incorporated into the building. Um, and also, ensuring mental health and emotional wellness for individuals at the level of like active living and play. Hammocks for adults, a swing potentially we're looking for in the um, like staff office space. Cause if you just need to get away from the stress that you're dealing with, um, you know, someone that has been lost their child or they don't have a home and they can't get the justice system to help them, then you just go on the swing for a minute and kind of take a mental health break or you go on the walking trail or have an outdoor walking meeting. Uh, on the resiliency side though, you'll see, and you've seen a lot with COVID that kids and youth are present in the virtual meetings that we have. This is not unusual for indigenous communities. This pre-COVID, we were doing this all along. I was brought up in meeting rooms since the age of like two or three. But we do want uh, individuals to really be able to focus on their programming. And when you have a little one on your arm, um, you sometimes can't focus on yourself as much. So it will have a daycare space and you'll see the amazing outdoor um, playscape that Sue has designed. But we wanna offer full-time daycare 
facilities so women can focus on the programming that they're receiving. We also have a space that will be for having healing circles and justice circles inside, but also spaces outside that, ref that reflect that and spaces where we can have family group conferencing if individuals have lost their children um, are with Micmac Family Children's Services, or if the family unit has broken down a space where they can come together and gather. And then the other spaces that are so exciting um, is our maker space. And we have one inside and outside being able to practice our traditional cult practices. So whether it's artisan work, bead work, quill work, uh, canoe making, hunting, and like cleaning moose hide, um, a lot of this knowledge has been lost. And so for healing for individuals, being able to do those things, to learn about them is significant, but it is also a way for women to be able to have some of their own um, economic independence and sell their goods. So we have these spaces that are available for teaching these things and open to the public as well. And a super exciting thing too, is that everything will be able to be web broadcast. So if you can't physically get to the center, you can tune in virtually to be able to get these lessons. And it's not just in our maker space, it's also will be in our teaching kitchen. So with residential schools, and then of course the 60 scoop, individuals really didn't learn about nutrition and cooking because you learn that when you watch your parents at residential schools, they certainly weren't teaching that. So one of the things that has been lost is that nutrition component. Also, uh, if you're living on welfare, you're, you can't really afford the healthiest food. Um, so our teaching kitchen will be teaching those classes virtually and in person to individuals, but it's also a commitment of the executive director of Nova Scotia Native Women that individuals visiting this space will never go without food. So we'll be providing food three times a day to all of the people receiving programming because a lot of them can't afford to eat or can't afford to eat much, um, as same, the same as their kids. So that will be offered. And then it can be converted over to a catering kitchen so that uh, when we're offering larger programs and you'll see this one space that Jordan will probably show later that has a that can um, accommodate larger meetings we have a, a little what is it an accordion wall is what I'm calling it Jordan um, uh, it will enable us to have to have these larger meeting settings as well so that's just a taste of what it looks like as well we're really hoping that food security uh, component for us to have all of those programs, we'll be having the food bank on site too. Uh, they currently don't have a home in Millbrook, but they uh, provide services to over 200 people. And given that the size that of the resiliency center and that it will be provincially based, so we'll have folks traveling in, the volume of people who will be visiting the food bank will be much higher as well, because we do hope um, to give out foods that our hunters have collected and they'll be kept in freezers um, that the need will be even greater in terms of providing those foods. So the teaching kitchen and gardens is really significant. The other big component, as I said, is Nadumalik, and I'll speak to that and then I'll hand the floor over uh, to Jordan, but I, the understanding of what this building is grounded in. So uh, on the next slide, you'll see an explanation on Nadumalik. It comes from the Unamagi Institute of Natural Resources. It's a very detailed explanation. What Nadumalik means is something beyond sustainability. So environmental sustainability is the terminology most people are familiar with uh, when we're talking about uh, or trying to understand things in terms of uh, being green or being net zero, but Nadumalik for the Mi'kmaq is even beyond environmental sustainability. Our understanding, it's a core value, a core cultural concept for the Mi'kmaq it's about living in harmony with one another. It's about balance. So you're talking about being whole in order for, the, for an individual to be whole and a nation to be whole and a society to be whole, you need to be in balance with the natural world and the human world. So Nadumalik is about reciprocity, taking only what you need, recognizing that we do harm to the world, but it's how do you reduce your harm? 
Um, no matter what you do, elders have taught me you, is that you will in some way harm your environment, but it's how do you cause the least amount of harm? Also, it's when I said you only take what you need, you don't take if it means that others cannot use that environment. And you don't take if it means that future generations are not protected. So that's what Ndumalik means. And for all of the individuals we've engaged, they said like, this has to be a key concept in the building because it's so important to our identity as Mi'kmaq. And so if we're talking about resilience, if we're talking about revitalization, then Ndumalik has to be incorporated into the entire building. So from the very beginning, this has been a key concept of what the design uh, or kind of guiding how the design has to, had to be done, I should say. So on that note, I'll lead it to the experts to talk more on that and hand it over to Jordan. Sabrina, thank you. Um, it's always um, so wonderful hearing you speak and just the, the layers upon layers that went into making this project what it is. Um, I think one of the things that really jumped out at me in your description, Nadumlik, is that just this idea of community nutrition, um, which I thought was a, it just, it's a really interesting phrase. And um, I think if we were to ask the question of what is resilience in architecture, um, to cultural resilience is a really big part of that, right? And it's um, you know, how can a building, how can a, a center, you know, help foster cultural resilience? Um, I think culture is, uh, in, in the sense of the resiliency center, is a very active word. It's not necessarily just something that's on the wall. It's not art. It's not sculpture. Um, so really to uh, use it to maximize and to to like foster this idea of cultural resilience in the building. We took a two-eyed seeing approach to design, which was developed by Albert Marshall um, of Eskasoni and and Mardina Marshall of Eskasoni. Um, and two-eyed seeing requires learning to see from one eye with the strengths of indigenous ways of knowing, and from the other eye with the strength of Western ways of knowing, and learning learning to use both of these eyes together for the benefit of all. So, you know, as green architects, um, we certainly come to each project with a significant amount of, of, of knowledge um, and, and ability to research, um, you know, our, our craft. But it was really important to us that we talk to the community and so we ask them, you know, what they needed to, that we ask Zabrina to point us in the direction of who to, who to talk to. And so there is considerable time invested in, you know, learning about. Um, the culture and history of women in Mi'kmaq society. Uh, so we interview el interviewed elders, ethnologists, linguists, dancers, um, seamstresses, designers, historians, uh, drummers. There's canoe makers, like traditional birch bark, birch bark canoe makers, craftspeople, cooks, and um, in the end, it really. Um, built up uh, a strong um, understanding um, within our design team. And two themes that really jumped out through that process, um, there were, sorry, there were two themes that jumped out in that process, one of which was water. Uh, the, these are two pictures here of our first meeting with the Nova Scotia Native Women's um, Association. And and we just had this big brainstorming session. Um, these boards were about 12 feet in length in total, but you can see it in blue there running right through this idea of water, our women, women is water. It's, um, you know, there's this consistent uh, language and, and in, the, in the stories and in um, the cult traditional culture of the Mi'kmaq uh, where women are re represented as water. There's also, you know, the ribbon skirt um, was something that was mentioned at that first meeting and then just came up again and again and again in our, in our community consultations. Um, the ribbon skirt is a 
culturally significant piece of regalia for Mi'kmaq women and acts as a powerful teacher of resilience and empowerment. You know, each women's unique pattern, you can see on the images on the right there, you know, tell her story with beauty and movement and craft and individuality. You know, the women put on their women, their ribbon skirts, they honor themselves, they recognize their history, their own identity, and they celebrate a culture that is constantly adapting. Um, you know, we, the top two, uh, top right images are of Elizabeth Paul's ribbon skirt. Uh, the image on the right hand side is from 1910. Um, the image on just in the center there is actually we took at the um, Natural History Museum in Halifax. The, um, you know, there's uh, and really amazing geometries that you see within these skirts. Um, the on the far left is a skirt from the 1930s, and then down below there are ribbon skirts at the Moderate Livelihood Fishery protests um, just in the last couple of years. Um, you, they've evolved over time, but they're they are consistently long skirts that connect a woman to Mother Nature to the ground while the body can connect to the sky. Uh, you know, and it's not solely a Mi'kmaq uh, piece of regalia. Like Deb Holland, uh, the US Secretary of the Interior wore a ribbon skirt to her swearing in ceremony in um, 2020. So to, with that two-eyed seeing approach, you know, what is carbon resilience within architecture? I think there's like a building needs to have be carbon resilient. And buildings account for 40% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions, and carbon dioxide is widely acknowledged to be a major contributor to the greenhouse effect, causing a rise in the mean temperature of the earth. I know I'm speaking to the choir here, um, but um, you know this isn't new. Um, Eunice, Eunice Foot demonstrated this all the way back in 1856, and so you know why are we talking about carbon, why are we talking about embodied carbon? Because operational emissions, you know, are far bigger over the course of a building's lifespan, right? This chart here is from Bruce King's excellent book, The New Carbon Architecture. And it shows really that, that case in point. If you see that steep curve at the bottom, um, that is the embodied carbon in a typical structure. And over the course of its lifespan, the operational carbon of a standard building um, will dwarf embodied carbon significantly. But as we start making improvements to our buildings from mainstream to energy efficient buildings to net zero buildings, the curve starts to change and the impact of embodied carbon and the, really is significant in the building stock. Um, you know, it's this space underneath a net zero building that is the real impact of the building. And, you know, really it's, the, there's, there's an imperative to um, get there because emissions are hugely amplified by when they occur. They, the more emissions that are coming now are going to impact our, 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 we're putting on a, us on a course um, to a climate emergency, and we need to make those changes soon. So what is the path to a resilient architecture? Um, the, in, in, our, in this case, in the Nova Scotia Native Women's Association Resiliency Center, um, I'm going to walk you through that quickly. Um, you can see this is our site. This is the power center in Millbrook, uh, the 102 is down on the bottom right hand corner with an overpass running across. Um, there's a number of large um, open spaces, cleared lots, um, casinos, you know, there's a movie theater. Um, our lot uh, that we are working on is the orange square there that's bounded on two sides by um, roads in the power center and is was a forested site. Uh, that Sue will take us through a bit more in a few minutes. Um, you know, one of the great things about this site 
was that it is um, it's on the grid of the power center, and the power center is on uh, the cardinal directions. Uh, so the site had the possibility for excellent solar exposure, plus it was a treed site. Um, and we really wanted, uh, because of the need and the desire for land-based healing on this, uh, in this project, we really wanted to, um, to minimize impact to uh, the forest cover. So these are a few images from er really early in the design process. Uh, but we we wanted to to minimize our clearing, um, creating a veg leaving a vegetated buffer. You can see there to the north, with the the center is on the south side of the building. Um, clearing as little as possible. It's really easy to clear for us. It's really it takes a really long time to grow it back, or it's mind blowingly expensive. And nature is pretty good at building for us. Um, we also cleared to the east of the building, intended to clear to the east of the building um, where that arrow is to really um, provide from the building views towards the parking lots that um, Zabrina was talking about. There were there are issues of human trafficking. We wanted the building to have a presence on site and to be a physical presence, not only, um, you know, uh, uh, just be a, to be a physical presence for uh, the community, um, you know, and 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 to provide eyes on the street. By, you know, the form was driven by the two main areas of the building: the office and the resiliency uh, wing. The resiliency wing being purple, the office being uh, red. Um, there is a clear need for a division of those public and private spaces. If you can think of the private spaces as a as the office wing um, and the public being more um, in within the resiliency and the healing spaces. So the, 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 the two areas of the building were shifted apart from each other uh, to give them a bit more distance. Um, this shift also helped us take advantage of passive solar design strategies. The elongated east-west forms of the building are really great for um, taking advantage of the, this massive ball of energy in the sky, um, the sun is basically it's 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 very predictable heat coming in on the southern side of that building, um, and the um, and then also provides excellent daylight throughout the space. The embodying that water theme that we talked earlier about circulation corridors that are shown here in blue flow through the central reception that connects the two wings together uh, with the fluidity of the stream, you know, curving through the building and into the landscape. The cir circulation really is the heart of this, the NSNWA Resiliency Center. You know, the corridors are used by everyone that enters into and out of the building. It's a social space um, and that are tributaries that run through the building. Um, you know, like rocks in the stream, um, there'll be skylights that are perched through this, the circulation paths, bringing daylight deep into the center of the building and also connecting the users with the sky. Um, the roof is that connecting, is the second connecting feature that really um, links the two uh, uh, program spaces together. This is a really early concept of, um, of the building, but you can see the, the idea was clear that there, we would have undulating um, roof forms of two skirts connected um, and almost dancing with each other. The undulating roof all, will provide an excellent place for the beautiful imagery of of ribbon bands can provide solar shading as needed for the for the performance and design of the building, and will also provide covered outdoor spaces. So, as I said, that was an early render, re rendering of the uh, of the idea, but you can see in these construction documents here how a lot of those themes really carried through into the project with simple rectilinear forms, elongated for solar access and daylight that 
sinuous um, circulation corridor running through the building like a stream and these you know the white uh, circles there being showing the skylights um, punched through the space and you know the here are a couple of final renderings of the project where you can see that undulating roof line uh, dancing back and forth around the building. We are really excited to share with you um, soon um, the ribbon patterns of the building that will be applied to that roof. Um, we're working with a uh, with two Mi'kmaq artists, a painter and a seamstress, on creating two unique identities for the buildings. Um, you know the that will. Um, really, I think, take this into the building to the next level. Uh, the, as Sabrina was saying as well, with daylight and solar access and performance of the building, windows are really critical. And the windows here take a number of different cues um, from like the, the uh, hatch pattern and the, the, the tin wheeling windows there, um, taking cues from quill work, quill work stitches and ribbon skirt patterns and the um, parallelogram windows and being an abstraction of the eight-pointed star and the NSNWA logo. Here's the southern side of that building. Um, between the north and the south, there's about a three to one window to wall ratio difference with the southern windows being, um, with there just being more windows on the south to allow deeper penetration of light and, and that beautiful heat that we want to take advantage of. Coming into the building, you can see the, that that fluidity of the corridors with the with this cedar lining bulkhead that runs uh, from the in the entry the entrance of the building and out into the both the office and the resiliency wing. The skylights. Below the skylight, um, there's also a marking on the floor, a circle on the floor, like the ribbon skirt, just connecting the user of the building from with the sky and the earth. There's um, also a lot of big uh, walls in these corridors, which will be lined, as Sabrina said, with um, fantastic art and uh, photographs and um, cultural regalia of um, Mi'kmaq women through lining the corridors. There's a variety of different um, program spaces within the center um, of different scales and um, don't have the time to necessarily take you through each individual one. But like Sabrina said, there's going to be a teaching kitchen. There's a maker space, an interior and an exterior maker space where people can come and actively learn culture. And that process of actively you know, participating in culture is also an act of healing. Storytelling is an act of healing and, and, and having a place for ceremony um, is a critical space, critical part of this, the design. Um, that can might be in, in a small intimate space like the one on the right or the bottom image on the left uh, is a space large enough to hold 100 people for larger events. So what is the, you know, how do you get there? You know, for carbon resilient architecture, it's critical to get as close as possible to net zero operational energy. And the first step in, of doing that is conservation of energy. Um, if you, you know, by conserving as much energy as possible, we can then reduce down um, the, the size of our mechanical systems, reduce down the amount of um, renewable energy, renewable, renewables that we need to put onto the building. So a high performance envelope in the case of this building, it's a thick duvet of insulation that's, that's thermally broken and continuous around um, the occupants inside. I think, you know, it's this duvet all the way around. The thing with a duvet or maybe even like a thick parka is if you leave your zipper open on your parka, you're going to be cold. 
So a continuous air barrier is really critical. You can see the red dashed line, it's only a partial section of the building, but the idea of, the, of an air barrier, the red line test is, can you run your pencil, your pen, your red pen, um, all the way around the building without lifting it? So the, there's a really carefully detailed uh, air barrier in the project. Uh, there's this misnomer that buildings breathe. Um, buildings don't breathe, they dry. And it's not a question of if they, they need to dry, it's just when they dry. Um, you know, if you, in the case of a wood building, the wood comes with a certain amount of moisture content within it. How does that moisture that's been inside of your wall get out? So it's a carefully, is it a really key part of a, you know, of a res carbon resilient building is having a highly permeable assembly for durability and longevity, making sure that your assemblies can dry both uh, inward or outward as needed. Final part of, of, of uh, is carbon sequestration in building materials. You maximize natural materials. At the NSNWA Resiliency Center, we're using wood trusses, cellulose insulation, wood framing, wood siding. You know, there's even nowadays as technology keeps evolving, there's options for mineral-based sequestration from uh, you know, it's a local company, Carbon Cure, that's this expanded uh, you know, globally at this point. Also minimize steel and foam. Um, only use it when it's really critical. In our project, we did we have used a few steel beams, um, like two steel beams and a few steel columns. I mean, that's primarily because of the uh, large solar array on the roof. So what does all this mean? You know, we, we have this uh, technically advanced envelope, but how does that actually, you know, help um, residents? Obviously there's the, 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 the resilience uh, of the building is that you'll have lower lower energy bills right there and then if you're operating an organization that's a really critical part of your long-term sustainability um there's a term called passive survivability that we really like and it's this idea of how can um a building um how can a building help sustain the life of its of the occupants um with out active systems running. So, you know, can it be, can a building be a lantern in the storm um, for people to come to? Well, one way to measure this idea of passive sustainable survivability um, is through uh, thermal energy demand intensity, uh, at, otherwise known as a TEDI. Uh, TEDI is a metric that represents the annual heating load per floor area of a building. And so this is the amount of heat that needs to offset the loss of heat through the building envelope. So NSNWA has a Teddy score. It's, it's modeled at, at a Teddy score of 24 kilowatt hours per meter square per year. And um, the, you know, there's great, that it's a fairly low Teddy score. And there's lots of really great benefits to a lower Teddy score. It ensures the long-term energy performance of the building. It improves occupant comfort, lowers energy bills. It improves the building's resilience. But I think the most interesting thing about a, a low Teddy score is this chart at the bottom here produced by the City of Toronto Zero, Zero Emission Building Framework, where you know, if you interpolate between, say, our, with our Teddy score of 24, between that 30 and 15 on the left there, you know, with 72 hours of the power being off, you know, the building holds, will hold a temperature, um, you know, around 18 degrees. After two weeks of no power, the building will still be sitting around 16 degrees inside. So the building, the, the, the Nova Scotia Women's Association, Native Women's Association Resiliency Center will be passively survivable, even in the event of um, a, a long-term uh, power outage. It'll be able to provide um, as a lantern in the storm. You know, there, as part of the path to net zero, there's gonna be a significant um, 
PV array on the building, a 70 kilowatt uh, array, root bounded array is going to take us to net zero. And we're also um, feeding um, some of that, uh, that energy into bat uh, on site battery systems as uh, local backup in the event of a power outage so that people could come there to charge phones, gather in, in, you know, in extreme events um, and have shelter. Um, another key, key element of, the, of a uh, resilient carbon building is you know, really this idea of embodied carbon and sequestered carbon. You know, like that, those charts in the very beginning, um, you know, that's where the, the primary impact of the building is going to be and uh, from a climate scale. And the chart on the right here is a comparison that we did in the office between a few projects that we've uh, been working on. Uh, the NSNWA project is, a, is on the far left, a comparable office building with uh, steel framing is in the middle, and then a tilt-up uh, project is on the far right-hand side there. And you can see that the NSNWA with all of the different components that we've talked about so far um, really is performing incredibly well um, with uh, at 78 um, a GWP per meter square, uh, sorry, global warming potential of uh, per meter square of 78, uh, which is phenomenally low. That 78, uh, just for clarity, that is a, um, in for a life cycle analysis, uh, that is a A to D life cycle analysis. Another way to look at that is that's a cradle to cradle analysis. A to C um, is um, really the, the first part of that, uh, of a life cycle analysis, um, which is a cradle to grave analysis. Um, because of the, and there's lots of ways that people, that the industry are, are looking at um, life cycle analysis right now. Um, an A to D analysis is still a very conservative analysis. You know, in the case of um, the NSNWA, the D cycle is the reuse recovery or cycling potential of a building. So if, for instance, in a wood building like ours, um, there's going to be at the end of life, say if the, if significant amount of this even goes into landfill, which would be surprising at the end of the life of this building. Um, the conservative approach here is to actually um, not uh, assume that all of that uh, uh, carbon is being released, uh, that some of it, and this is all based on uh, the breakdown of wood over long-term cycles. So on the whole, a resilient building um, is uh, maximizes embodied carbon and 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 recognizes, um, sorry, maximizes sequestered carbon and really recognizes uh, the embodied carbon within a structure. So I'm going to just show a couple of quick construction images um, before handing it over to Sue. Uh, you can see this drone shot here from just a few weeks ago of the building taking shape um, with the two uh, wings and the undulating uh, roof lines. I think that Sue is going to get into it a bit more, but there's um, the cons the contractors, uh, Lindsay Construction have done an amazing job of limiting uh, the creep of that of the limit of uh, the construction site um, into that forest. We've really uh, Sue and I and the contractors staked out a line, and they've really held to it because it's like I said before, it's a lot easier to cut down the forest than it is to grow it. Uh, here are a couple other exterior images, the building taking shape. As you can see, it doesn't look like anything quite else in the, in the, in the power center. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Sue. Thank you, Jordan, and uh, what a pleasure to be speaking with Jordan and Sabrina, and what a what an act to follow. This building is uh, and this 
this whole project, as you can hear, is a pretty amazing uh, piece to be a part of. I feel so fortunate uh, to have been a part, to be a part of it. I also love the landscape. You can hear the building, the organization is amazing. The building is amazing. And the land, Jordan, if we can switch to the next stage, when we talk about resiliency, next. I feel so strongly that this land already tells the story of resilience. This area was clear cut probably 18 to 20 years ago. There is a forest, a young forest coming back up again. What you see in the left-hand image is one of the trees that was cut down. This was a mature red maple. It probably had a diameter, a trunk diameter of, you know, at least a foot. Uh, cut down uh, during the clear cutting of the site those 18 years ago. But what we see on the right hand side of the image is the new shoots that have grown from that same tree trunk. I love how this land is as, as it is today. And so when we talk about that construction fence and, and making sure that we did not clear any more land than we needed to. It was very intentional. Jordan, if you switch to the next slide, it's intentional for a number of reasons. That land is important and the, the plant material and the growth that's there is important for the land-based healing initiatives that the, that the women want to have on this, on this uh, as part of the center. But it also will really make our project stand out so differently than the rest of the power center. When you look at the power center right now, uh, it, is, it, is, it is a clear cut again for all of the new developments. So you see uh, very few trees, you see a lot of parking lot. Keeping our trees is good from an environmental perspective from, for so many reasons, in addition uh, to the ones that apply to the center. It's also the best way for us to manage stormwater on site, to recharge the, to collect and that forest will allow recharge of water into the aquifer below. The, the not clear cutting for parking lots helps us reduce the heat island effect by keeping that leafy green forest around us. Sabrina was really clear that safety is such a big issue and they raised it right away. Uh, when we talked about maintaining a lot of this forest, the women raised it right away when we talked about maintaining a lot of this forest cover. So it will be strategically cleared so that you can, uh, when we cut our pathways and trailways, that will increase the visibility through there, but we will likely go back and make sure that, uh, that sight lines are clear will thin some of this area as well. But it makes a very big difference, right? Amazing new building and that ribbon skirt defining the, the edge of the uh, roof line with the artwork that'll be there, with the trees on the site. This is unlike anything that you've probably seen uh, in Nova Scotia before. So next slide, Jordan. Landscape influences, what, what were the influences in the design process? And hands down, the, the visions and dreams of the women uh, were, are, so in, are, are what have informed the landscape design. The, the, Jordan spoke of the number of different um, uh, indigenous knowledge keepers that we spoke to, an amazing list of canoe makers and beaters and uh, historians and, and anthropologists, amazing. Those knowledge keepers and the women have really guided the landscape plan as well as the, uh, as the building plan itself. Resiliency of the land we've spoken about, the Mi'kmaq teachings we've also spoken about, beautiful concepts that, we'll, that we as in our office will incorporate in every other project we move forward with from here. The Resiliency Center, briefly spoken of, I'll talk about it in a moment too, also a huge influence when you see the images. The four directions, sky, mother earth, and ourselves, also very important in informing how the landscape evolved, landscape design evolved for this project. Next. 
Oh, and the, the Mi'kmaq medicine books that were there, um, the plant books are available and full of amazing information about traditional um, uses uh, of, of the plant material. These have been part of my uh, bookshelf. They've been on my bookshelf for decades uh, and resource material for me uh, for a long time. So it's wonderful to be able to take that information, everything from how plants were used to the Mi'kmaq names for plants. Uh, and and where to, and information about where they grew, very valuable resources if anybody's interested in the plant material. Next, this is these are the images from the Resiliency Lodge that Sabrina spoke with, the National Center for Healing, and it is it is beautiful when you see those images, and you can understand right away the calm uh, that is intentionally built into the landscape design, the integration of the built environment and the land. Wonderful for me to see as a designer. There are so, so wonderful vision, hopes, dreams, ideas for this building. And a colleague of mine, Virginia Burt, uses this wonderful phrase, as landscape architects, we walk this magical path with practical feet. In our landscape planning, there is a lot of very practical details that we have to look after. Safety, lighting, accessibility is mandatory. Our pathways, our grading and our drainage. We have to make sure that we get these pieces right because um, it will be problematic if it doesn't drain properly and the, the path in front of your doorway freezes. You know, we have to practically think about all those things like garbage and recycling and maintenance. Snow clearing is another one. We have to think through how is the snow plow gonna move through this space? So it's easy uh, for, uh, for uh, maintaining it during the winter. Thinking about how we interact with the climate in different spaces and really is really important. Sometimes, as all Nova Scotians know, you need to be in the sun to stay warm. In the, in the shoulder seasons, in the summer, we need shade spaces. We need a canopy so we can be out of the rain on those beautiful uh, warm you know, days in summer, where as the Newfoundlanders say, it's an RDF day, a rain drizzle fog day. You just need a spot where you can be outside. Um, but covered and not, not get wet in that. And parking, of course, is another really important piece. But then on this project, uh, there are so many other uh, amazing things that are happening above and beyond the really practical components. Things like a sweat lodge, a ceremonial fire scent space, a dance circle. There is a really uh, wonderful playground based on the fishery a request specifically from the women. There's a, there are multiple areas for an outdoor kitchen. The outdoor connected kitchen is connected to the indoor kitchen. There is um, a barbecue, a smoker, um, a place to grill meat. There is a sheltered outdoor maker space. Connection to water extends, as Jordan said, right through the building. We are catching the roof water and incorporating it into the playground. With, with another feature I'll talk about in just a second. We have to have comfortable seating outside. Some of it's integrated into the building design. Some of it will be movable and some of it will be hammocks as Sabrina spoke to. And you can see the image that we're using as reference. Uh, same as the uh, same, same as we uh, did down on the Halifax waterfront and other locations across Halifax. Um, a wonderful opportunity to, to take a break uh, from and rest and find that uh, space to just be calm and be outside. We also take into consideration the views outdoors and one of those beautiful windows that Jordan was talking about connected to the eight pointed star. Look through that window in the image and you can see that it's important for myself as a landscape architect to be thinking about what are people going to be seeing from the inside out. We have to look at the relationship um, between those indoor and outdoor spaces. Staff space uh, is also very important, but is separate. And there is that included in this in the project as well. And there's a smoking station, which is an unusual one. I'm gonna switch to the next slide because it's more interesting than the text. These are some of the reference images. And it's a really interesting thing to be designing 
in collaboration, co-creating these spaces. Because my job as a landscape architect is to create the location for these spaces. But it is the elders and our knowledge keepers that will actually, and the community, that will actually build the sweat lodge itself. Similarly, the dance circle, it's, it, um, we are creating the space for the dance circle. We are specifying all of the requirements for the subgrade material, for the, for the grass that will be on the dance circle. Uh, but it is the elders and the knowledge keepers and the women who will actually be almost like doing the finishing details for these spaces. Very important finishing details, but you can start to feel the, the energy around it. And most of you will not recognize this as a playground, but this is this is this is the future site on the right hand side is the future site of the, the this fishery themed playground. And the drawing on the left hand side is our working drawings, our tender drawings for the site. You can see many things are happening. Jordan, if you hit the next slide. This is the space, when I talk about adjacencies and thinking about how the interior space relates to the out outside space, this little corner that's created by the two buildings is where the playground will be sited. It is very intentional. This is eyes on the children from both the office and the resiliency wing. They will, moms will be able to watch their kids uh, from inside the building with ease. Next slide. The fishery playground is based around three periods, time periods in the history of uh, the fishery. So the modern day lobster, lobster boat, uh, the canoe and the fishing weir. The lobster, all of the, the whole playground is based on, on natural play. There are no hard plastic elements. There's no metal coming into the project site. It's all connected to natural materials. Um, and you can see that the fishing weir in the lower right-hand image is actually, is actually being constructed of live plant, live willow to create a tunnel for the kids to run through. So it's, it's conceptual, but it's also play. Next slide, please. And if you hit the next one, Jordan, I needed to know from the women, because we, we make, you know, lobster, lobster play structures are fairly common in the Maritimes. But I needed to know, I need to go back to the women, it's like, what is going to make this Mi'kmaq? What's going to make this a Mi'kmaq fishing boat? Uh, what, are the, what are the elements that's going to make it different from every other playground? And I heard wonderful things. Um, and it's just a one little, one little story was uh, Karen, who we've spoken, the executive director we've spoken about already, is a dynamo, but she said, we need, it needs to be loud. I'm like, wow, tell me more. And what she meant was, what she said was the, uh, the fishing boats are loud. We have music on our fishing boats. We need to have music uh, on the boats. And so we're, we're busy sorting out how to add that into the project. But also things, the Mi'kmaq components like, like charts that show the night sky and how people navigate it. A name, a Mi'kmaq name for our, our lobster boat. Those are the kinds of things that we are uh, that we are incorporating into each of the pieces within the uh, within the playground area. Next, there are also uh, the water play area. Is collect this is the spot where we're collecting the roof water, um, which will be active, of course, during the storm events. There's also a pump on that so that um, the adults can manage when the kids have water uh, in those times when there isn't roof water in the stream channel. There are also uh, storytelling circles. There are four drums uh, on the project site. There is a, on the playground area, there is a small dance area for the kids. There is, there are also um, uh, a black ash trees, which was so important in the traditional basket making history of the Mi'kmaq community. Next slide. I have to also meet, very practical CSA Z614-20 standards, safety standards. You can see those yellow tools. If a, 
I can't have a space separating playground elements unless if it's if it's a big space, not a head can go through, but the body must also follow so that no child gets caught. So very practical things that we have to also design to. Next slide. I'm speeding up because I see the time. <laughs> Uh, this is a picture of a component of the site. So you can see the layout of the where you can see the highlighted areas, starting on the left, the ceremonial circle, uh, ceremonial fire uh, sent circle, the sweat lodge in close proximity, close enough proximity to the building, but within that forested area. There is location there. We had, had we had food gardens in here and garden um, shed and things like that. We were not able to continue that with the funding at the time, but it is there for future garden spaces. What we did do is add in fruit trees so that there is easy access to food uh, in, in when those mature and produce fruit. There's the dance circle and the fishery playground and the main entryway. So you can see how those things are laid out. Next slide. There are also elements throughout our project, like I mentioned, that are, um, <laughs> are this is the first set of drawings um, that have been uh, put, put, that my office has put through the federal review process that has things that do not fit in their very formal tender process. Um, and the procurement process for the federal government, you know, it has to be flawless. And many of the things that we are doing here uh, did not meet their, um, you know, they didn't like how, how we were proposing these ideas because they couldn't understand how you would procure it. And so we have what we call a number of elements that are, are not in the contract, that are outside the contract, but essential to the completion of these spaces. For example, the women wanted, want the cultural components of the Mi'kmaq community integrated into this project. Things like the petroglyphs, we want them, we want to have carved in the in the playground on stones. Wigwams are essential, uh, you know, we want these pieces, we want wigwams in the playground as well. We will see how those things unfold. There's an outdoor maker space too, which is uh, again to carry over on the interior maker space, and use this space to be outside and do those all those wonderful crafts and uh, and skill building components that Sabrina spoke about. Next, the land based healing initiative. Uh, is near and dear uh, to the to the center, to the organization, to the Mi'kmaq people. It is a beautiful piece uh, for all of. There's already a lot of very very important plant material on this site in that regenerating forest we spoke about. There are when you reference back to the to books that I mentioned, these plants are spoken about. They are important. We are going to be creating a series of trails that, that cut through this land to take women to these places where you can see, you know, what does the alder look like? You can find out the Mi'kmaq name. This is the first project that we started using the Mi'kmaq plant names as a component of our plant list in our very formal, federally approved uh, procurement drawings. So next image, please. There is a very extensive planting plan to when we cut the when we cut the forest for the construction uh, zone to define that construction limit that limit of construction. There is a hard edge on that um, forest, and so we are using plant materials around the plant plants around the perimeter, but we are also using plants to create privacy and screen specific things. You'll see a lot around the fire circle, for example. Um, and those plants are all native and adapted species. They're all um, hopefully going to be sourced regionally uh, from folks who are growing these plants for us locally. But I also, Many of them are also food crops, so blueberries are in there, for example. And if we switch to the next slide, 
you can also see that we incorporated medicinal and ceremonial plants in the planting plan. So on the north side of the building, we have tobacco. East, of course, is sweet grass. To the south, you will see cedars in our planting plan. To the west, you will see sage. And Jordan, I think that is my last, next is my last slide. And that is the uh, building as it was just a week ago. It, you can see that buffer of plant material that creates both privacy and a place and, and really is that connection to the land as we finish this building up as that flourishes um, there's that connection between the land and the building and the center. And I will wrap up on that note because it is exactly 5.30. <laughs> I will hand it back over to our facilitator. Thank you so much. Um, that was such a great presentation. Um, I didn't mention it at the beginning, but if our speakers do have a couple extra minutes, um, you can enter some questions into the chat and we'll try and answer them for you. Um, but yes, thank you so much. Sabrina, you did a great uh, job at not just communicating what the need was, but how great it is. And, um, and it looks like you are all working very um, hard to make sure this is a, a very multifaceted space. And based on the pictures that I've seen, it, it seems like um, you will be pretty successful in creating a space that um, can be a, a, a place uh, where these, uh, where, where its visitors feel comfortable. And it, it, it definitely, uh, the pictures really, it does look like a, a place of refuge to me. So thank you so much and um, yeah, and thank you to everyone for attending. Um, like I said, please enter your, your questions in the chat if you have any, and we'll try and answer those for you. Um, but yeah, um, this has been very, very informative. And I think that everyone watching will definitely be, be keeping track of the project and, and looking to see um, the, the final product. I know that I definitely will. And also I'll let folks know, this is the last thing I'll say, um, if you, I think you can also uh, raise your hand and if you have a question and you want to ask your question out loud, we can unmute you and you can ask your question. Claire, I will say once the center's up, Karen intends to also have programs available to the public too. So um, once that's developed, then we'll we'll share that with everyone. So you can always visit the center as well. Amazing. That's really great news to hear. And if anyone does want to take a quick look from the road, it is. Uh, just right off the highway at the Millbrook exit. You can't miss it. It's take a left and it's uh, right there. It's quite, quite easy to find. It's also really fun right now when you drive up off the exit uh, towards the building. There's a, there's a windmill in the background above this now very, very orange building uh, with its, with its wrap around it. It, it's, it. it is impressive when you see it. It's really impressive to see a space that uh, I feel like there there were so many boxes that you folks had to check off and and still look at, it seems like it's really going above and beyond just looking at like the Teddy score and the the uh, LCA results that that you got it's it's very very impressive. So. And I think that some of those scores too like especially the LCA. Like it does not take into consideration Sue's work, of, you know, which is all carbon. <laughs> it's, and you're not, you're choosing not to put in plastic or steel playground equipment. You know, we're using naturalized trail systems. We're, we're taking advantage of the existing forest cover that is there. Like there's an LCA is an amazing metric that's really 
changing the way that we look at a lot of different things, architecture, products, things like that. But um, once again, it's it's a conservative metric because it has to be. And there are a lot of things in it that aren't considered. And you have to ask, why wouldn't, why do we clear cut our sites before construction all the time? Um, mm -hmm because we have this plant material that does the work for us uh, in terms of carbon. And it's just, it's just hard to see over and over, for me, it's hard to see over and over and over again, the clear cutting that's happening. Definitely. And then, yeah, like all those, uh, like from the landscape, it seems like it definitely contributes to what Sabrina was talking about earlier where, you know, um, like the natural light and the natural landscape uh, would definitely contribute to kind of um, people's mental health who are um, residing mm -hmm. in that building. So, so much that goes unaccounted for in, in metrics, but is so important. And I think it really ties in keeping the trees in place to really ties into New Dumoulin. Hey, they're really taking care of this land and it's taking care of us. We don't have to deal with the storm water in the same way, um, heat island effect. It's it's good for your mental health. There's just so many positives. I remember during right after Fiona coming to the site, and we had cleared the site to the limits of construction, and um, we were that was the day the right that we were walking and and just trying to refine the, the, the limits of construction. And it was clear that over Fiona that it must have been tens of thousands of birds came to mm -hmm. this site because the forest was covered in um, their waste. <laughs> but it was just, you know, it, it like if we had, if, if why did they pick this site? Why did they come here? You know, it was just this, it was a center of refuge. <laughs> Safety. Yeah, yeah, safety. That's amazing. Wow. And they conveniently fertilize the forest for us. <laughs> A win win. <laughs> Great. Well, all right. Well, if there's no questions, which is actually pretty rare, you guys must have done a very comprehensive presentation. Um, we can wrap up and um, unless you have anything to add, of course you feel free to cut me off. Um, but thank you all again for coming, um, presenters and attendees alike. Uh, we do record these webinars and we post them on the EAC website on our Better Building Speaker Series page. It's a bit of a mouthful, but you can Google it, it'll pop up. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you want to look back on the presentation at all, um, you can definitely do it there. And um, I'm sure we'll all be watching uh, to see the final product, which I'm sure will be very good. <laughs> so thank you all for coming and um, everybody have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.